Boys and young men learn early on that being a so-called real man means you have to take on this tough guys. In other words, you have to show the world only certain parts of yourself that the dominant culture has defined as manly. You can find out what those qualities are if you just listen to young men themselves. A real man is physical. Strong. Independent. He's powerful. Physical. Intimidating. Strong. Independent. In control. Rugged. Scarce people. Powerful. Respected. Hard. A stud. Athletic. He's muscular. A real man is tough. 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 And just as most young men know what our culture expects of a so-called real man, they also know very well what you get called if you don't measure up. To be a real man, to be tough, strong, independent, respected, means fitting into this narrow box that defines manhood. The terms that are the opposite of that, wuss, wimp, fag, sissy, are insults that are used to keep boys boxed in. So if you're a boy, it's pretty clear there's a lot of pressure on you to conform, to put up the act, to be just one of the guys. So the next question is, where do boys learn this? Obviously, they learn it in many different places. They learn from their families, their community. But one of the most important places they learn it is the powerful and pervasive media system, which provides a steady stream of images that define manhood as connected with dominance, power, and control. This is true across all racial and ethnic groups, but it's even more pronounced for men of color because there is so little diversity of images of them to begin with in the media culture. For example, Latino men are almost always presented either as boxers, criminals, or tough guys in the barrio, and Asian American men are disproportionately portrayed as martial artists or violent criminals. But transcending race, what the media do is help to construct violent masculinity as a cultural norm. In other words, violence isn't so much a deviation as it is an accepted part of masculinity. We have to start examining this system and offering alternatives because one of the major consequences of all of this is that there's been a growing connection made in our society between being a man and being violent. In fact, some of the most serious problems in contemporary American society, especially those connected with violence, can be looked at as essentially problems in contemporary American masculinity. For example, over 85% of the people who commit murder are men, and the women that do often do so as a defense against men who are battering them. 90% of people who commit violent physical assault are men. 95% of serious domestic violence is perpetrated by males, and it's been estimated that one in four men will use violence against a partner in their lifetime. Over 95% of dating violence is committed by men, and very often it's young men in their teens. Studies have found that men are responsible for between 85 and 95% of child sexual abuse, whether the victim is female or male. And 99.8% of people in prison convicted of rape are men. What this shows is that an awful lot of boys and men are inflicting an incredible level of pain and suffering, both on themselves and on others. And we know that much of the violence is cyclical, that many boys who are abused as children grow up and become perpetrators themselves. So calling attention to the way that masculinity is connected to these problems is not anti-male. It's just being honest about what's going on in boys and men's lives. And while women have been at the forefront of change and trying to talk about these issues in the culture, it's not just women who will benefit if men's lives are transformed. In fact, while men commit a shameful level of violence against women in our society, Statistically speaking, the major victims of men's violence are other males. There are millions of male trauma survivors walking around today, men who were bullied as adolescents or abused physically or sexually as children. Thousands more men and boys are murdered or assaulted every year, usually by other men. So men have a stake in dealing with these problems, and not just those of us who have been victims, but also those men who are violent or who have taken on the tough guys they do so also at the expense of their emotional and relational lives. Some of my friends, they, um, I don't know, they'll just like walk around like, you know, they're better than everybody and, and they're tough and all that stuff. And then like I'd be alone with them and they'd be like the biggest baby. If they have like a problem with like a girlfriend or something, they'd be like crying and stuff. But when they're around a lot of people, they've got like that big front. They got to be like, you know, tough. I deal with this front all the time in my own work as an anti-violence educator. I've worked with literally thousands of boys and men on high school, college, and professional sports teams, in the United States military, in juvenile detention centers. 
I've seen an awful lot of men and young men put on this tough guys. In many ways, they're putting it on as a survival mechanism. They have to do it to survive in whatever peer culture they happen to be in. But putting on the tough guys comes with, it, with a cost, and that is a cost in terms of damage to their psyches and their ability to be decent human beings. So it's in everyone's interest to examine masculinity, to pull back the curtain on the tough guy posing and see what's really going on underneath. All of this is gonna take a lot of work, and it's not gonna happen with just individual boys and men being more reflective about their choices. It's gonna to have to happen both on a personal and on an institutional level. Everyone has a role to play here, and not just men. While girls and women are not responsible for men's violence, they too have an important role to play, because the tough guys is attractive to men in part because they see many girls and women validating it. Girls and women have to show that they're looking for more in men than bad boy posturing, and in particular, that they value men who reject the tough guys. We also have to work to change the institutions that create our present choices. For example, we need to break the monopoly of the media system that we've been looking at, where mostly rich white men dictate to the whole society the kinds of images and stories of manhood that surround us. Many men today are searching for new, healthier, self-respecting ways of being men in a rapidly changing world. We need to hear their stories, too, and learn from them. In different ways, all of us have to struggle for real cultural and structural changes in this society if we want our sons and their sons to have a chance of being better men.